Okay, so we've watched the video. Oh my gosh, I love that video. I think it's super funny that you've got these fish that can recognize another fish in their territory. So let's start off with what's written in here. A sign stimulus is an external cue. And we had said for a behavior, there's gonna be a stimulus followed by a response. A sign stimulus has a predictable response. So you're going to have a sign, this is gonna be the same thing as a signal that's gonna be perceived by the fish and it's gonna give you a predictable outcome. So a fixed action pattern is a different kind of behavior. So let's talk about that first. So whenever you have a fixed action, a lot of times biology is not as weird as it seems, like the definition really is built into the term. Fixed action means that when you have this stimulus, the response is a predictable pattern. So for example, if you're a goose and you have an egg that rolls out of the nest and it's maybe, let's say, starting to roll out of the nest, so you perceive it rolling. And so as it rolls out of the nest, you're going to have the response of taking your wing and scooping that egg back into the nest. That can't be stopped it's a fixed action as soon as that bird perceives the egg moving out of the nest. So what people did, they would take the egg and start to let it go out of the nest. So the bird perceived, oh, that egg is rolling out of the nest. And then the person would put the egg back and the goose would still sweep nothing into the nest. Because once that stimulus has been perceived, the fixed action occurs regardless. It's a pattern that has to go to completion. And it doesn't have, it's not like something you think about. It's gonna be innate. Innate means you're born with it. And in this case, it's fixed. So, it's not like the goose goes, come on, dude, like, psh, quit doing that. Quit putting the egg back in there. They're going to move toward the nest regardless of whether there's an egg to scoot back or not because that's the way it works. The stimulus results in the response regardless of the situation. So it's the same kind of thing with the fish. So in this particular case, that sign stimulus, which is an external cue, a fixed action pattern, is the red belly. So it's the red belly. And they did a really good job with making sure it was the red belly. So they had examples where that they had, you know, little models that look like a fish that had the red belly. They used a fish without the red belly. They did some weird shaped things that were not fish, but had a red belly. And so in response to red, so here's the stimulus, red, the response is to attack. And so it wasn't the shape of the fish. They ruled that out. It was the red underbelly. Really, it's just red. So this type of response that's in eight like this has an ultimate causation of allowing those organisms to be more successful because fish don't think. That's not part of what they do. They have stimuli and various different responses, but when it's a fixed action, there's one response. And those tend to be for essential things. Like if the goose didn't have the response to scoop that egg back, and there were several different possible responses, then those choices make it to where that there's not that likely survival. 
If the only choice you have is to scoop it back in, it's because scooping it back in is the most successful of the choices. So fixed action has to do with, you have a stimulus and the response, and this one is will occur regardless. So if you put the fish in the water and you take the fish out, it's gonna attack nothing because it's a fixed action response. All right, this is when I used to do, a, I may have to actually do this. I usually do this by walking. This particular set of behaviors, they're really hard for students. I don't know why, but they're really difficult. Um, they have to do with movement, so there are types of movement, and there are two different types of innate movement. Um, I'm gonna draw them for you first, and then I'm going to maybe walk and include a video where I show you what it looks like. So, kinesis and taxes. They're both gonna be movements. So that's the response. And so they're gonna be a response to different stimuli. So to start off with, let's go with the simple one. Kinesis is more simple. So organisms that are not as complex will do kinesis where organisms that are more complex will do both. So this is a more complex behavior of movement. So in kinesis, we're talking about this because we do pill bugs. Pill bugs are just roly polies and they go through primarily kinesis. So what they'll have, it's, it's a movement response and the stimulus is just the environment. So it's environmental conditions. So this is the way kinesis works. Let me make sure I can probably move that a little bit. So if you've got a pill bug in a Petri dish, so in this Petri dish, I'm gonna put some moist dirt on this side. So there's that. I'm gonna use my blue pen to be the pill bug. So we're gonna drop the pill bug in and the pill bug will begin to move in response to a new environment. In general, they have what are called orienting behaviors. It's how they orient themselves to their space. So for them, they tend to walk the perimeter. So it would probably start by walking like this. Okay, so that's movement one. Once the orienting behavior has occurred, then we're going to move to kinesis. Kinesis is a random movement. So the pill bug when the pill bug perceives the stimulus of bad environment, the response type of movement is to be fast and to have few turns. So what this does, this right here, is going to minimize the time in that environment. So what that looks like is this. So this pill bug perceives, let's say everything except the moist dirt is perceived as a bad environment. So all in this area, you're gonna be able to track the pill bug moving quickly and making few turns. So this is an example of kinesis in a bad environment. So now I'm going to 
move it over to my other side. Put my moist dirt back. Let me make sure we can see that. Okay, so put the pill bug in again, orients itself to its surroundings, and it's going to, over in this area, perceive this as not favorable. So the response would be move fast and make few turns. By random chance, this pill bug got to the moist dirt, which is a good environment. So this is gonna be an example of kinesis. Again, random movement. The pill bug was not moving to the dirt. It just happened there. So the stimulus is a good environment and the response will be to move slowly and to turn a lot. So what that'll do is, can you still see this? I probably should move over here. Maximize the time in the good environment. So the pill bug would, instead of moving quickly, it's going to, let me use this. Uh, pink. Pink. Will pink show? So the pill bug is going to make a lot of turns moving slowly. Now I'm moving my pencil pretty quick, but it's going to make a lot of turns and it'll maximize the time there. Now at some point, it's going to get out of the good environment and it's going to, well, that's why I can't use pencils. It's going to end up back in the bad environment and it'll move quickly and make few turns. If it ends up back here again, it'll move slowly and turn a lot, turn a lot. Sometimes it's so slow, like they're kind of staying. So that's kinesis. And the big, big deal about kinesis is this pill bug only perceives where its feet land. It doesn't know what's in front of it, what's behind it. It will not perceive until it's actually there. So this is going to be an example is our pill bug is only going to respond to the environment where it's feet. Are, where its little feetsies are, okay? It's not able to go, oh man, you put me over here and I really would like to be over there in the good stuff and it has no idea. It knows I'm here. It moves, I'm here. Still not a good environment. I move quickly. Ooh, still not a good environment. I move quickly. Still not a good environment. I turn, still not a good environment. And it's going to do that until all of a sudden, oh, my feet landed in a good environment. So the response is slow your roll, slow down, turn a lot. So you'll maximize the time there. Now they're not thinking about this. This is all innate. It's built in. Innate means every pill bug does it. They're born this way. So let's talk about taxes. Taxes is different. So for taxes, let's use an example. Okay, you can see me. So taxes, you have to have two different areas. There's gonna be directed movement movement to one area and this would be the area that's favorable so let's do an example of a moth so I'm gonna put a lamp so here there's more light and as you get over here, this, 
there's going to be less light. When you have two areas that are different in the amount of something, that's called a gradient. So a gradient is two areas that differ in the amount of a resource. So it could be resource with the C. Yes. Okay. So it could be more light, less light. It could be more water, less water, more food, less food, more or less in areas next to each other. That's what a gradient is. Gradient means literally that there's a difference between an area. And a lot of times, like if you do things online and you're used to choosing, they'll give you an option like, do you want to have something really, really dark, a little bit less dark, a little bit less dark, almost not dark at all. And then you can use your cursor, right? And you can pick along this gradient from dark to light. So that's what this is. So you've got your moth. Here's your moth. Oh, moth. Ah, it's not bad. Okay, there's your moth. He's happy moth. Put him a little smile. Happy moth. Perceives the stimulant. The stimulus is going to be light. This moth is pretty sophisticated. It can not just perceive light. It can perceive more light. So when it's this way looking, it perceives that there's more light coming into its eye than in this area. So it's perceiving both areas at the same time. And the response for a moth is to move toward, directed, the light. So it would fly, come here pencil, it would fly to the light. It's not gonna do this, hey, is it good, is it bad, is it good, is it bad? It's gonna go fairly directly toward either more or less in the gradient. So a lot of organisms, so if you throw open, like you pick up a log and I have a bunch of insects underneath there, so let's put like a, I don't know, let's put, ooh, this is gonna get scary. Grasshopper. Oh, I'm on a roll. Sweet legs. Oh, wow, I'm so proud of me. Okay, so here's my grasshopper and he's under a log and I move the log and he perceives light, a lot of light, and his response is gonna be to move away from the light. Also taxes. So there's directed movement either toward or away from that stimulus. So examples of animal communication, I guess I'll put this here. Don't be me. Let's be a little more organized in our, what we do. I'm used to having a lot bigger paper. Let's be truthful. I'm kind of spoiled. So they're going to communicate through signals. Whenever you see signals, think stimulus. So the different types of stimuli that animals throw out there to communicate, so they're putting these stimuli out into the environment, will be things like they'll have a smell, They'll have, so that's usually something that would be a chemical that would be released like a pheromone. Hello, skunk. And it could be visual. So that moth could have great big eyeballs. And so it's visual and you're like, because you think it's a predator. Um, it could be tactile. So ants, they're really funny. Like when they come back, they like, where have you been? Or where have you been? And they literally touch all over each other. And their antenna can pick up the chemicals, so it's both. And then if you have ever watched shows or been to Bays Mountain with auditory, like for wolves, they howl. So all of these are going to be ways 
that animals communicate. Animals. So, and it's going to be very different, the response, depending on what organism. Like for me, if I hear a wolf howl, I probably will howl back, but I probably shouldn't. But I should probably run. So, there's going to be a different response depending on what organism perceives that stimulus. Okay, I think that's it for that first strip. I need to know how that went. I know this is a mess. Don't judge. Be nice. We'll figure this part out. What I'll probably do is start working on a whiteboard so that you can see what I've put on the whiteboard and you can move it to your paper. What I wanted to show you with this is... I mean, obviously, I didn't have to listen to somebody and write. Even still, though, notice how this is like super neat, looks like I know what I'm doing. Over here, I went back and I rethought about some things. And I wrote notes all over the place, and that's not so neat. So, you have to do your notebook how you learn. Nobody's ever going to take your notebook up and go, mm, there's not enough color you're scribbly, you put eyeballs on your mouth, none of that. You just need to be able to do some type of note taking from instruction. So next time I'll try the whiteboard, I gotta find it and we'll see how that goes. All right, you're the best. I wish you were here with me. I miss you already. Like, I don't even know you, but just say so you no. Know, I always make the decision to like you before I meet you. So that's a given. Your teacher likes you, whole bunches. So I miss you already, but we'll figure something out where you can start talking to me. We'll put a little appointment slots so I can see your faces. All right, thank you for hanging in there with me. I'd love feedback.